Thank you very much. Thank you for, for, for giving me this opportunity to speak here. And please ask uh, questions if you have some. So I would like to discuss um, uh, some work that uh, I've been doing with uh, colleagues on uh, models that are used in biology to, to represent the dynamics of populations that are structured by a phenotypic trait, which is typically how resistant you are to heat and by a space variable. Okay, there, has, there have been uh, quite some demand on the biology side for de development of the theory uh, that is available to, to analyze such populations. And so we have been several people, myself, uh, Vincent, and other people, to, to work on this. So here are the collaborators on this, uh, these works. <laughs> First, Cepide Miraimi, who is a, bio, uh, a mathematician in Toulouse. Then Robin Aguilet, François Rousset, and Ophélie Rons, who are biologists in, uh, in Montpellier and in Toulouse. And uh, here, uh, José Mendez, who's a PhD student with me and two biologists, François Massol and Nicolas Loy. Okay, so this is a map that has been uh, proposed in 2003 for the impact of climate change on beach tree populations. So the beech tree is the main, I mean, the most emblematic uh, tree of European forests, and it will be impacted by, by the climate change. And the question is, how, how much is it going to be impacted? And this is the first, the first map that has been done. And this is where the beech tree is present at the moment. This is its range. And then they have some uh, uh, biological scenarios and they try to guess where the population is going to be present in 60 years from now. And 60 years is how much, how much time you need to wait to collect the trees, right? So the trees that are planted now, they will be collected in 2080. So it's really close in terms of uh, forestry. And what we have represented here in black is the areas where the, tr the trees will die before you can collect them. Right? And the light green one are the areas where the tree could survive by 2080. Right? Yes? <laughs> Which scenario? Is it, is it a, uh, a pessimistic one or a uh, one? I don't really know because it, it's really, it's a long time ago and the, the, pessimism, I mean, the pessimism of a biological scenario seems to have gone up since then, so <laughs> I, I don't really know. I don't really know. Right, but but um, yeah. So so um, the idea is you had a, a lot of work that have been done by the climatic people, people doing meteorology to to try to forecast the evolution of climate. Uh, but on the biology side, uh, it's uh, less of a traditional way of thinking about biology, and so there's I think uh, still a lot of work uh, that has to be done to see the impact of climate change on populations. So how was this one done? Well, they have just looked at the correlation between the presence or absence of the population and the environmental factors, like the quantity of, uh, of water you get, the temperature, the type of soil, etc. Right? And they consider that where this species is present now corresponds to the environmental uh, conditions that allow survival of this species. And then they jump 60 years ahead, right? And they try to assess where those uh, conditions for survivability are met, right? So this is what is done here. So in particular, we don't try to follow the trees. So we don't know if those individuals would actually succeed to spread there, for instance, right? So it's, a, in a sense, quite a rough mathematical model that is underlying, and the main difficulty is to collect the data and to treat the data. But the mathematical, mathematical model underneath the stat statistics is, uh, is rather simple. And, um, uh, sorry, and, and so these predictions have made a lot of people uh, uh, worried, uh, people like people dealing with forestry, insurance people, and public, uh, public policy managers. 
And basically what they have said is, uh, well, how much should we trust that, right? Should we right away change our uh, policies for forestry, right? Should we give up on the beech tree and, and plant some pine trees instead, right? What should we do? Should we change uh, the time for collection, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? And what is problematic is that we don't really know how much we can trust those predictions. Right, because they are, so mathematical model is quite simple and it's not so easy to, to refine it, right? There, there are not so many connections between those simple mathematical models and more detailed ones. And so here we, try, we propose a study of some more mathematical, more precise mathematical models. So here is a, a little flower that grows about everywhere in the world. And what biologists have done is that they have collected some seeds from this flower, brought them to Germany in one single garden, and they have grown it there. And then they have recorded at what time do those flowers bloom. And this is what is plotted here. You see that depending on the origin of the seeds, the flower will bloom either early and over a short period of time, or much later in the season and over an extended period of time. Okay, so actually those, all those seeds are from the same flower, same flower species, but you see that the behavior is quite different. And why is it so different? Well, it is because of uh, the environmental uh, uh, conditions uh, uh, where the seeds come from, right? So the seeds that come from hot regions like this, almost in the desert, well, when you're in the desert, so one thing that you want to do is to flower early, right, before the heat comes up. But if you come from a, a cold region, right, you, where you have snow, it's dangerous to flower early or to flower over a short period of time. So you tend to spread your flowering season and to, uh, to flower later. Okay, so we see here that there is a really a dif a difference between the individuals that come from here and the individuals that have come from there. So when we had before just a map like that with a gray color where for everywhere where the, 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 the species is present, indeed we are not collecting all the data that we should, right? Because uh, the trees that are here are probably very different from the one here on top, right? And so when the climate is gonna change, it's not clear that those individuals will be adapted to the temperature that you will have there in 2080, right? And the one in the north, maybe they will also not be in the right condition. What we need to do is to follow the whole structure of the population in both space, as it is done here, and phenotype. Okay? So that's quite a challenge. So there is a model that is quite detailed. It is not, uh, it has not, uh, uh, real connections with data at the moment, but it's a, uh, a model that is uh, quite widely used in biology, in theoretical biology, and that is quite precise. It was introduced by Kirkpatrick and Barton in 1997, and it describes the dynamics of n, the population size at a certain time t and location x, and a mean phenotypic trait, so the mean trait that is present at time t and location x. And the model is as follows. You have the population size as diffuses. Then you have a reproduction that depends on the mean phenotypic trait. So if the mean phenotypic trait uh, of your population is not too far from an optimal phenotypic trait, that could depend, for instance, on the temperature at that time t and location x, then the growth rate will be positive. Okay? Then here we have a competition, minus n square just like we would have uh, for classical ecology models without evolution. So the second equation is a bit more complicated, right? We recognize here a diffusion, so the trait diffuses in space, that we can understand well. Then here we have a drift term that is a bit unusual, uh, but uh, well, it will appear in the computations. And then here we have a selection term, we have selection that has as an effect to bring Z closer to the optimal phenotypic trait. Right? And the success of this model comes from this graph here. You let the two parameters A and B vary, 
And when you do so, you observe uh, three different uh, dynamics, which is quite rich and interesting. The first one is extinction. So assume that the conditions are changing too fast in space, right? If you adapted the location, uh, a precise location, as soon as you move a little bit, you will not adapt it anymore, right? And then you will not be able to survive. Then, on the contrary, if the conditions are almost the same everywhere, then you can survive and propagate throughout the space. And then you have an intermediate situation where you survive, succeed to survive, but you don't spread. Okay. Okay. So uh, this model is interesting, and we would like we wanted to to build on that, right? To surround this, uh, to connect this model to other models that are existing either in, uh, bio, in ecology or in population genetics. And we introduce this uh, more detailed model that describes the population not only by its population size and mean phenotypic trait, but by a whole distribution, little n for time t and spatial location x, a whole distribution along the y variable which is a phenotypic trait. And what do we have in this model, where we have those four uh, parts that are typical from sexual population in space, we have a dispersion term here, right? we just dispersed in X. Then we have a selection, we die if we are far from the optimal phenotypic trait uh, at our position X and time T. We have a competition term. It's not good to be surrounded by too many of our peers because they will eat our food. And then we have a reproduction term, right? This reproduction term is called the infin infinitesimal model. So where does it come from? Well, it's a model that comes from population genetics, which is the field that originates from artificial selection, from breeding, for agriculture. And there they have studied quite a lot the, the genetic structure and how we can uh, manipulate the genetics of species. And to obtain that, we consider that the individuals carry a set of alleles, right? A finite number of alleles, big L. And those alleles can be either plus one or minus one, okay? And then we want to compute the phenotypic trait of this individual that we call Y. And we have Y equals the average of, uh, yeah, let, let's do it for, like that first. So it's, it's Y. Okay? So like this, you see that we can connect a trait that is, let's say, continuous to something that is discrete. And with this discrete thing, we can uh, model uh, sexual reproduction. How do we model sexual reproduction? We'll have two such uh, vectors. These are the two parents. And I want to produce one offspring. For each, each locus loci of the offspring, I take with uniform uh, law either this one or that one, right? So I kind of mix the, 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 the alleles of the two parents, okay? If I do so, um, on average, I will have here, the, if I count the number of plus one, I will have the, the number of uh, plus one of this one average with the number of uh, plus one of this one, okay? So that's not actually so interesting. So what we will add as a condition is that here we, are, we have the sum of the yi that, that is almost zero, right? Okay, so we, we have the yi's that are equilibrated, and here what we'll consider is not this one, it's something with square root here, okay? And if we do so, what we get is not only the average that will be conserved by that, 
but we'll get the standard deviation around that. Okay? And so the trait of this one, y, will be a Gaussian distribution centered in the average of the parent trait. Okay, if the, the traits here were y star and y star prime. Okay, and so this is what gives us the distribution law of the, the offspring, and this is this Gaussian distribution here. Okay, if we have one parent of trait y star and one parent of trait y star prime, then the offspring will have a trait y that will be distributed as a Gaussian distribution with a specific variance that is given by the model actually. Uh, okay, like that, right? And then to, to see the, the trait of, the, uh, of all the children, you just have to integrate that with the possible parents, right? Which is this double integral y star and y star prime. Finally, we divide by the integral of, y, of n because we consider that the number of offspring is proportional to the number of individuals, right? We consider here that the females, typically, are uh, the limitant factors, right? We don't really care about the males, and then we have something that is linear. Okay, uh, and one important factor that I will play with is this gamma here. This gamma that is also there represents the, the speed of generations, right? How fast do individuals reproduce? Okay. Okay. So, how to analyze this, uh, this model and how can I connect it to the Kirkpatrick Barton model that I had earlier? What I can simply do is to write the first um, uh, moments of this equation. So, I call big N the integral of N in Y, right? I just count everybody that is present at time t and location x. And then z would be the first moment, right? The mean phenotypic trait. And I can write equations on n and z, and I obtain something that looks a bit like the Kirkpatrick Barton model. I just have some additional terms that are higher order moments, which is something very typical in this kind of situations. Okay? So, uh, I have higher order moments and I need somehow to close the model, right? I don't know what the, those higher mo moments are a priori. And to do so, I will assume that gamma is large, right? This gamma that I had before here. And now let's look at that in a formal way. If I have gamma that is really large, I can kind of forget about everything else, right? At the main order, I will just have dTn equals gamma times this thing, minus gamma n, which I have written here. And if I do that, I can notice that this is something that will conserve the population mass, right? I have, uh, I, I have uh, here a creation of, uh, uh, of big N individual at each time step, and here I, 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 have, I subtract uh, big N individuals, okay? So I don't change the population mass. I don't change also the mean phenotypic trait. But what I do change are the higher order moments. And this operator, it leads the second uh, moment of the distribution to a given value A, and the third moment to zero, okay? So this is true when we have an equality here, but I can assume that the same thing will happen uh, in the original equation, and using that, I can obtain, actually, the Kirkpatrick-Barton model, okay? So the, the Kirkpatrick-Barton model is a gamma-large asymptotics of this more uh, detailed model. We can do some simulations, right? So if you remember what, what the, this kinetic model was, it's not too difficult to, to simulate, because this one can actually be written as a double convolution, right? We have something minus something else, so it's kind of a, a convolution, which means you can use spectral methods. And doing so, you can simulate like that. Here I have sp the spatial variable. Here's a trait variable, and what I will see is that the population will be uh, 
will have a trait that is close to the optimal trait at that location, and it will propagate along this optimal trait in space. From this, I can draw the population size big N and the mean phenotypic trait Z. Okay? And I can compare that to simpler models on N and Z, and I see that I have a good match. Okay? So here is the population, it's spreading to the right. And here is the population trait, and we'll see that it converges to the mean phenotypic, the, the optimal phenotypic trait that is in red here in the middle. Okay, so that works well. Now, let's come back to this. So we had something that was formal and we would like to make it a bit more rigorous, okay? So I, will, I have this reproduction term that is a leading one and to make things simpler, I will call it big T, okay? T, big T is a reproduction uh, operator. And I have an interesting inequality that comes from kinetic theory that was written by Tanaka. Uh, originally, it's uh, for uh, uh, particle gases, right? When you have some particles with certain speeds and then they collide, right? So the speeds would be this Y star or Y, right? And the collision represents exactly this thing here, right? So actually here you can see if you assume that Y star and Y star primes are speeds, when you have a reproduction, you can see it as the two particles that will glue together at the average speed between Y star and Y star prime. And then you add a little bit on, of noise through this Gaussian, right? And so you can use the, what has been done by Tanaka on, uh, on the Boltzmann equation, and you obtain this inequality here, right? This is W2, the Wasserstein distance. So maybe I write just uh, the definition of the Wasserstein distance. So you have mu and nu that are two probability distribution. Uh, the two here means that the integral of x squared d mu x is finite. Right? And if you have two probability measures with finite second moment, you can write a distance by W2, I write the square of mu nu, is the minimum the pi, uh, so I will write first, I have the minimum of x minus y, Right, this is a transport measure. So imagine I take some mass from x and I transport it to y. This costs me x minus y square. And then I have to prescribe how I will move the mass from one measure to the next, right? And this is pi. So I want pi to transport this one into this one. So I say that the first marginal of pi is mu and the second marginal of pi is nu, okay? And so this describes the, 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 the Wasserstein distance. And this is a very con convenient distance because uh, it works well in measures. And here uh, we have convolutions and a lot of things that work well in measure too. Okay, so we have a contraction here. So this is much stronger than what we had before, which was just a convergence of a finite number of moments. Hey, in, a one, in a way, we have convergence of all the moments at the same time, right? Provided we have a finite second moment for n tilde and n tilde. Okay? So let's use that. It's a result on the probability measures, and here we have a population that is not necessarily of size one everywhere. So the first step is to renormalize the solution. So I defined n tilde, which is just n divided by the number of individuals that you have a time t and location x. If I do so, I can write an equation on n tilde, which is this one. It's similar to the one we had before. We have a dt n tilde minus Laplacian n tilde, and then we have here the reproduction operator. But we have also some more specific term like this one that actually looks like the one we have for the Kirkpatrick-Barton model. 
Okay? So these weird terms that we had in the kirkpatrick barton model can be seen as an effect of this normalization of the population. The way, well, okay. Okay, so how can we prove that when gamma is large, the solution of this equation look like the solution of the kirkpatrick barton model? Well, we have uh, several steps to follow. First, we assume that we have an L infinity bound on Z, on the mean phenotypic trait, right? This is what we start from, okay? And the goal will be to build a loop and to arrive back at that when gamma is large, okay? So we start from that, and then we get from this one some bounds on higher moments of the distribution, namely on the fourth moment here, okay? And actually, we use the structure of the equation. If we look at the equation on, on V, on this fourth moment, we have something that is negative here, so that's good for us. And then we have something like a V to a certain power, and then here we have a minus V, which is very good, okay? And so using this structure, we can show that a bound on the mean phenotypic rate Z, like this, implies a bound on the fourth moment, right? And that's really good, because when you have a higher moment uh, estimate, you can then interpolate that with a moment, let's say, on the second moment, and have everything in between. The second step is to consider the macroscopic equation, so the equation on N and Z. These are the two first moments of the distribution. And they satisfy something like that, right? Uh, with some higher order moments. Here we see that you, you, don't, you cannot write that in terms of N and Z because you have also the, 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 the second and third moments that will kick in, right? But let's leave it like that. Uh, we know that this is finite because we have a control on the fourth moment, and what we need to do is just to show that these n and z are regular, okay? These are L infinity, so that's okay to, to, to use nash moser estimates, right? nash moser estimates are for elliptic equation where you have L infinity term, L infinity bounds on terms. The only difficulty is to control this term here, right? Because n is... I mean, it's not clear that n is bounded from below, and so you have to be a bit careful, but you can do it, and then you show that both n and z are older in time and position. Right? So you have some regularity, and what is really interesting is that those regularity estimates do not depend on gamma. They are uniform in gamma, right? and that's very good because we want to let gamma go to infinity. Now, let's go back to the full distribution, this n tilde. We have this equation here, but now we know that those advection terms here are not too bad, right? Because we know that n is older continuous. This is older continuous, and so we can use that to show that um, when time moves forward, the so individuals will move around, but not too much. Okay, and so you can use the contraction from the Tanaka inequality locally in uh, X, right? For each time t, locally in X, you use the Tanaka inequality. And then, since the individual actually do not move too much around, this will be enough to show that globally, the distribution will look like the Maxwellian of the reproduction operator here, which is a Gaussian, okay? Okay, and finally, now we know that the n and the z are not too bad, they are regular, and we know that the distribution looks like a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so this term is not too big, and we can use that to arrive at an L infinity bound on z, which was the assumption we started from. Okay, so if we put all of this together, we obtain this result. The little n, that depends on time t, position x, and third speak trait y is close when gamma is large to n, the population size n, times the Gaussian distribution centered as a certain z of t and x. And this n and z are given by the kirkpatrick barton model that we had before, okay? So we have sh shown that actually 
the more complicated model is well described when gamma is large by the uh, simpler model on N and Z. And this is an explicit construction, so all the constants here are explicit. Uh, it's not only, it doesn't only hold when gamma is equal to infinity. And numerically, we can, we can check how good this is. And actually, when gamma is, let's say, larger than one or two, it's already a very good fit, okay? So it's not an empty result in this sense. So I'll move on with an application on that. Uh, this is a work that I've done with the biology that I mentioned at the beginning on the impact of, uh, of pollen dispersal on the, uh, on the dynamics of uh, population submitted to climate change. So the question is the following. You have climate change, you know that it's very bad because the, the trait of, uh, of uh, the population will not move forward. Right? The populations that are in the south, they are adapted to heat, right? but these will die, and then the heat will come to, to the individuals that are in the north that are adapted at the moment to cold temperatures. Okay? So that's really bad. And you would like to help the, the traits to move northwards too. Right? You would like the, the trait of resistance to heat of, the, of the, the individuals that are in the south of Europe move up. Right? And one hope to, to achieve that is to take advantage of pollen dispersal. Because pollen disperses at a range, at a distance that is much bigger than seeds. Okay? And pollen doesn't trans, I mean, it's not like uh, seeds, right? They cannot grow on themselves if they arrive somewhere, but they transport traits. Okay? So could this help transport the traits of heat resistance northwards? So to study that, we have uh, used this uh, model, this kinetic model, where we have a population n of t, x, and y. We have exactly the same model as before, except for this reproduction operator here. Right? Before we had that with n of t, x, y star, and n of t, x, y star prime, which are the two parents. Here we consider one, one parent is like that, but the other one, instead of being directly a parent, it's the pollen. It's the pollen P, and the pollen P can be transported over large distances. So P is actually, let's say, a convolution of this N in X. Okay? So this is a complicated model, but can, we can write formally, at least, a limit of that, and we get this modified kirkpatrick barton model, where the impact of the pollen, sorry, this should be alpha, can be seen in those two factors. Before we had, let's, this should be alpha, alpha equals zero, right? And now we have alpha that is not necessarily zero, right? Alpha is between zero and one. So if alpha is close to zero, the pollen will not have much influence, and if alpha is one, it means the pollen disperses over a very, very large distance, okay? And now we have to, go to model climate change. We just consider that the, the effect of climate change is to move northwards the optimal phenotypic trait. We have an optimal phenotypic trait that is a straight line and is shifted towards the north. Okay? And the question is, is my population going to be able to follow this line of, uh, of uh, good environmental conditions? So to do so, actually, we don't do uh, uh, complicated mathematics. We just uh, generalize a result that has been proposed by Pease, Landy, and Bull, who found a very uh, neat, exact solution for this kirkpatrick barton model, the one that I had at the beginning. When you replace the competition term that we had here, we had a minus n by a minus lambda, with where lambda is a, a given a real number, okay? So this is kind, if, if you are used to linearization, this would be like linearizing the first equation with respect to, to n, uh, even though here you have z for, that you don't linearize, for instance, and you don't linearize the second one, right? So that's something a bit weird. But when you do so, you can find some exact solution. Z is just a straight line that is shifting, and n is a Gaussian distribution, right? And it turns out that um, you can proceed as you would do with uh, linearization 
the survival of the population correspond to the sign of lambda, right? If lambda is positive, it means the population will survive. If it's negative, the population will die, okay? And this allows you to define uh, a critical lambda, a critical speed, for instance, above which if the climate change is faster than a certain critical speed, the population goes extinct. If it's smaller, the population survives, okay? And numerically, this solution seemed to give some uh, interesting information, although no mathematical results exist on that yet. So we have generalized this with also a Gaussian distribution, but the difference is, um, I will maybe draw it here. So, let's consider two times. This is a t equals zero, and this is at a larger time. Okay? If you consider the, the solution that we had uh, with the, the original Kirkpatrick-Barton model, you had that the so solution was something like a Gaussian centered here, okay? And if you let time evolve, this population will just be shifted like that northwards. So actually, if you consider the Kirkpatrick model without pollen, the population will not adapt to, to, to heat, right? It will not evolve at all. It will just move, no move northwards, right? And in this generalization that seems to make sense uh, numerically, we see that we have a, a, a situation that is more uh, intermediate. We have a population that will shift northwards, but it will also adapt to heat. So the population will move something like that here. Okay? So that's interesting because um, in the first situation where you had no adaptation, you could think, well, do we need to care about adaptation, right? And to see that this, the, the fact that the population do not adapt is not very robust seems to indicate that we have to be a bit careful about uh, drawing conclusion out of that, okay? And so we can define a critical speed for this, more, this generalized model, and we obtain this conclusion here that um, if the, gra the gradient of the temperature is high, so the, temp the, temp the optimal phenotypic trait uh, is, is steep, uh, has a steep uh, uh, curve in space, it's, um, it's a good thing to disperse a lot your pollen. If it doesn't, you shouldn't uh, disperse, pollen can be, uh, pollen dispersion can be detrimental, okay? And then you have intermediate situations too. So just uh, to comment on the, why it was interesting to do the math part of this, uh, this work, there are two uh, interesting things that we had. It was for the modeling, right? We, we could see the impact of, uh, of pollen disper dispersion. And there is a second thing, which is the numerics. So we can do some numerics on this limit model here, right? But this, this model here, oh no, sorry, the one, the one here. But this model, the way the biologists understand it is that it's a model written with an assumption that the phenotypic variance of the population is constant. So the second moment of the distribution of the population in the Y is constant. And this, is, this can be seen as a consequence of our hydrodynamic limit. Right? The hydrodynamic limit fixes the second moment of the distribution, right? And that's a problem for biologists because the variance of the, of the typ phenotypic trait is directly related to the ability of a population to evolve, right? If you want to, uh, to breed some cows, for instance, right? You want to, to have better cows that produce more milk. You have a choice, which is, do you select for longer milking periods 
or for more milk each day, right? What is the best uh, thing you should target for, right? And uh, a priori, it's difficult to, to, to guess. What they do is they look at the very phenotypic variance in, on those traits in natural populations. They look at cows that we have now. Do we have more variance on the amount of milk you give each day or on the milking period? And if you have more variance, it means it would be easier for, to select for that. Okay, so there's a culture on, uh, that is existing on the importance of, of this, uh, of this uh, variance of the phenotypic trait. And when we do that, we assume that the variance of the phenotypic trait is constant, that that's not good. And there is no refinement of this model to allow for a, a non-fixed variance of the phenotypic trait. So what we were able to do, thanks to this limit, is just to to do numerics on that and to check that the fact that the variance, phenotypic variance of the population did not have too much impact. Okay. Uh, okay. Now let's move on to something that is more on perspectives. Um, when we look at that, we think very much of traveling waves. Right? This really see, looks like a population that is propagating northwards. Right? And so the natural question is, can we prove actually that there exist some traveling waves like that going northwards? Um, so uh, there's a first question, which is, can we do that on the Kirkpatrick-Barton model, the model on, on N and Z? And this is a question that has been addressed by uh, Judith Miller, but I think there is still a lot of work on that. And what I will present is more how to build a propagation front for the kinetic model. And to do so, we'll consider a slightly simp simpler situation than the one we have seen so far. Oops, okay, sorry. So, um, one of the difficulties that we have with this propagation front is that if you look at the mean phenotypic trait of the population, assume that you have an optimal trait that looks like that, the mean phenotypic trait of the population will follow this one for a while, and then it will go away like that. And we don't really know where it's going here, right? We don't really even know what to do numerically for that one, right? So there's a difficulty. And I don't want to take care of this at the moment. So what I will do is consider a different model where the evolution is not like a selection to get closer to optimal phenotypic traits that depend on time, but consider a situation where you have a propagation along the space variable like that, right? And then you simply have two traits that are favored, that are different. If you are in a, in a location where there are few people around you, you have selection for y equals zero, right? And if you are in a crowded area, you have selection for y equals one, okay? So you see how you will still have some evolution, but now everything is bounded because you attract either to one or zero. So it will be simpler, okay? And a biological example of that is on the work that we have done with Sylvain Gordon, a biologist, and Quentin Griette, who's, who, who will arrive in Bordeaux next year. And it's this one we have some bacteria, E. coli, and those bacteria can be infected by some viruses. Now those viruses, they can adopt two strategies to, to, to spread. They can either uh, reproduce as much as they can within the bacteria and just break the bacteria apart, right? They, will, they infect the host, then they reproduce a lot, and they kill the host, and they try to find someone else. Okay? This is a very virulent strategy. You don't care about your host, you just want to maximize how many offsprings you do. But there is also a second strategy, which is you 
integrate the DNA of the bacteria, and then you protect it from further infection. Right? And then you just reproduce along with the bacteria, and once in a while, you will switch and burst one of those bacteria. Okay? So this strategy is very good when you have a lot of susceptible bacteria around you. Right? If there are lots of bacteria that you can infect, I mean, just be nasty with your host, it's not a problem. But if everyone is infected, it's a very bad idea to kill your host. Okay? And if you consider, do experiments, you see that those two strategies are included in all the lambda phages that are those vi viruses. And depending on the conditions, you will have either evolution with mostly this strategy or mostly that one. Okay? So this is something that we see in practice. So this model kind of makes sense. And so this is what we can write to obtain this situation. The goal is simply that we can expect this n, this mean phenotypic trait, to be bounded at all times. Okay? Now, we have this model. Now that we have z that is bounded, this model is actually not too complicated. We can build propagation fronts from this one, for this one. And the challenge is to go from propagative fronts for this microscopic model to propagative fronts for the microscopic model that is there. Okay? When gamma is large, to combine the propagation fronts from this one with the microscopic limit that we had before. So this is what we have for this macroscopic model. We have some bounds on n, some bounds on z, regularity, bounds on the speed, and some uh, monotony results. And that's more than enough to show that there exists propagation fault. Right? Let me maybe present briefly the possible strategies to show the existence of traveling waves. I don't know how familiar with, uh, you are with traveling waves, but let's consider a situation dTn minus Laplacian in Xn equals n1 minus n, right? And n of t and x is the population. Okay, this is a thick Kirkpatrick Bart, uh, the uh, Fisher KPP equation, and we have propagation of the population with this one, right? And we want to see propagation of the population, so we will look for solutions n of t of an x that look like a certain profile u of x minus ct. If we plug this one in, what we get is minus u, c u prime minus u double prime equals u one minus u. And we, are, we want to find both a profile u and a speed c, okay? To do so, there are several methods. The first method is a phase plan. You consider a vector u that is u and u prime. And then you see that writing this is exactly looking for solutions of a certain ODE. And you can do the phase plan. So we'll have U here and U prime here. And you want some solutions that connect what you have on the left. You look for solutions that look like that. So that connects u equals 1 and u prime equals 0 to u equals 0 and u prime equals 0. So you look for a solution that is like that. Okay? So that's the first method. Sorry? So I should, should be quick. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first method, but this is like quite specific to when you have only uh, this in dimension 2. Right? You have a second... A second method, that is to use monotonicity. Okay? Using monotonicity, if you have some propagation fronts that are monotone like that, you can trap solutions into two such fronts, 
and use that to construct propagation fronts. And then the third one, that is a topo topological method. Okay? And let's say that when you move down to three, the more uh, flexible the methods are gonna be, right? And so we want something flexible because we are not in dimension two because we have something that is infinite dimensional and we have no monotonicity because we have a lot of terms, we don't know what, what they are, right? So we are stuck with the third method. And the third method, what is it? Well, you will have minus C U prime minus U double prime equals U one minus U. The idea is you will add here a little coefficient, tau for instance, right? And then you will modify this tau. So if tau equal to zero, you have a problem that is linear, and then you know it very well. You know very well the solutions, and you can in particular consider a map such that the, the roots of this map will be the solution of this thing, right? And when tau, tau is equal to zero, you will be able to, to compute the index of, uh, of this map on a certain uh, set. Right? And this set is exactly the one that I have represented here. The so set of C that satisfies that, and then N that satisfies all the other ones. Right? So here I have a natural set, and I can compute the index. Right? So I can compute this index for N and Z, but I can also compute it for the more complicated case where I have a little N like that. Right? And what I need is to have some information on this set on what happens when tau evolves. And the problem when tau evolves is that the solutions of that can get out of the set. And this is something we don't want, right? Uh, but uh, we can use here uh, the information that we had on the macroscopic model, right? Sorry, talk, talk. Here we know for the macroscopic thing that we don't get out of this set. And then using the macroscopic limit, we know that the behavior will be very close to that for the, macro, the kinetic model also, right? So you can combine the, the two well. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to speak about that, but maybe, maybe I will stop here. <laughs> Thank you.